Today's guests are Dr. Ray Dorsey and Dr. Michael Oaken. They are on the front lines of the battle to solve Parkinson's disease, and they're co-authors of the book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, A Prescription for Action. Dr. Ray Dorsey is the David M. Levy Professor of Neurology at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Dr. Dorsey is helping investigate new treatments for movement disorders and improve the way care is delivered for individuals with Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders. He was also honored in 2015 as one of the White House's Champions of Change. Dr. Michael Oaken is the Adelaide Lackner Professor and Chair of Neurology at the University of Florida. He's one of the world's leading Parkinson's researchers and has advanced surgical treatments for the disease. He's the National Medical Director of the Parkinson's Foundation, the country's largest Parkinson's disease patient and advocacy group. Dr. Ray Dorsey and Dr. Mike Loken, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Chris, thank you very much for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. You were commenting before the show that the difference in the uh, the thickness of each of your jackets, one in, in Rochester, one in Florida, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so first, how did each of you choose your careers in medicine in general, and what motivated you to focus on Parkinson's disease specifically? Michael, you want to start? Sure. So, um, so, you know, for me, um, you know, I always wanted to be a teacher, Chris. And so my first love is history and, uh, I love history, reading, um, teaching. And, um, and as I found my way through school, there weren't a lot of jobs in history. And so I came from a Jewish family and my dad said, you're a Jewish kid. So that means you need to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. Choose one of those three. And so I thought about it and I thought, that's ah, probably pretty good advice. A lot of my history professors weren't super happy with their careers. There was a lot going on at that time. There weren't a lot of jobs out there. And so I chose doctor. And honestly, um, I thought I'd go out into the community and service people in rural areas and have a stethoscope and help people recover from illnesses. And I couldn't have told you the difference between a neurologist and a neurosurgeon and in my first semester in um, medical school, I took this class called neuroscience that 97 out of 100 of us were vomiting. And I was one of the three going, this is the coolest you know, thing ever. <laughs> and the rest is history. So vomiting made you where you are today. That's fantastic. That's exactly right. <laughs> Dr. Dorsey? Mine's a little simpler. Uh, both my parents are physicians. They're both actually psychiatrists. And as long as I knew I always wanted to be a physician because my parents were, I did have an act of rebellion and I didn't go into psychiatry and I chose neurology instead. The boring route. <laughs> when people think of medical advances being made in Rochester, they usually think of Rochester, Minnesota and Mayo Clinic. Dr. Dorsey, why is Rochester, New York, a leader in Parkinson's disease? Uh, it is because we've had some outstanding people like Dr. Ira Scholson and Dr. Carl Kiebert, um, who in the early, in the 1980s, really came up with this idea that academics like uh, Michael Ogan and I and others around the country and around the world could investigate new treatments uh, for Parkinson's disease. And over the last 30 years, um, to make at least four uh, new treatments for Parkinson's disease have had their clinical trials conducted and organized uh, here at the University of Rochester. I've been really fortunate to follow in their footsteps and then work with people like Michael to expand our scope from finding just new treatments for the disease, but thinking about ways to prevent people from getting the disease in the first place. So pre-COVID, did you plan trips to go see Dr. Oaken around January, February, you know, so this time of year? So Michael and I are going to see each other uh, tomorrow in uh, New York City, I think for the first time in, I don't know, two years, and since we wrote the book. I like, got uh, two years ago, we'll be we to be able to see uh, one another. So uh, we're looking forward to it. And Michael uh, owes a, a hosting in a warmer climate uh, for us up here uh, with cold winters. Well, I'm, I'm just outside New York City. And so it's about 50, 52 degrees. So you're in, in for good weather. Uh, Dr. Oaken, you might want to bring a little bit of thicker jacket than what you're wearing. Just, you know, for a little, consider yourself warned. Yeah, well, I'll try to stay indoors and uh, <laughs> hopefully I won't need it. And Dr. Dorsey, you said you're inspired to co-author Ending Parkinson's Disease, A Prescription for Action, because Parkinson's disease is the fastest growing brain disorder in the world, even faster than Alzheimer's disease. How do we account for that? And what's, the, what's driving the rise in Parkinson's disease? So uh, aging is one big factor. So as people age, their likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease uh, increases, uh, actually triples every decade. But if you look at the rate, the curve for Parkinson's disease is actually it mirrors that for lung cancer. Uh, so people develop lung cancer at older ages too. 
And I think just like lung cancer isn't a disease of aging per se, I don't think Parkinson's disease is necessarily a disease of aging. I think it's a disease of environmental risks. And instead of smoking, which causes lung cancer, I think there are environmental risks, including pesticides that are used throughout the United States, including one called Paraquat, uh, that's widely used even in New York State. Industrial chemicals, including those uh, that were commonly used by dry cleaners, chemical called trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene, and then air pollution. I'd say other these three factors, pesticides, certain industrial chemicals, and air pollution all increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. They're all products and byproducts of the Industrial Revolution. And as you look at the world, the areas of the world that are most industrialized have the highest rates of Parkinson's disease. Areas that are least industrialized have the lowest rates. And areas of the world that are going the most rapid industrialization, like China and India, have the fastest increasing rates of the disease. I wouldn't have thought of climate change as a driver of something like this, and that's fascinating. And that's all you hear yeah, about not in climate the financial change, world. per se, but, 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 uh, air pollution. Air, so right. the nice thing about well, the nice thing about air pollution is really trackable. So we saw in the midst of the COVID nineteen pandemic that Los Angeles had its cleanest air in in recorded history. You saw uh, air over China improve uh, vastly. So we can make tangible uh, changes to air pollution. These small, tiny air air particles in the air that we can actually see when you see smog uh, by just changing our behavior and see and reap great benefits in a short period of time. Dr. Oaken, let's take a step back and help our audience understand what Parkinson's is. Please walk us through the early symptoms, what happens as it advances and how it's treated. Yeah, so Parkinson's disease is uh, what some people have described as maybe the most complex disease in clinical medicine. That's a pretty big statement. And you say, well, you're saying, all right, defend yourself on that one. Well, it turns out that if you list all the symptoms of Parkinson, it's not just a disease of shaking. In fact, you know, even though four out of five people will shake with Parkinson, one out of five won't. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of what we call motor symptoms, tremor, stiffness, slowness, but there are also non-motor symptoms, depression, anxiety, sleeping dysfunction, apathy. So when you take Parkinson and you take all of these symptoms that can change over time, so it's dynamic, and then you give people dopamine, okay? Because it, one of the chemicals that's affected in Parkinson is dopamine. And we all remember the great movie by Robin Williams, Awakenings. They give them the dopamine, right? And they awaken up. And this is still probably the most phenomenal thing that we see in medicine is the change with dopamine. There's nothing like it. And then we have, you know, leads we can put in people's brains, deep brain stimulators, dozens of different medicines, cocktails as things change. So it's a complex brain disease and actually affects multiple systems, not just the brain, but it can be the skin and it can be other organs as well. And it's progressive over time. And guess what? It's not one disease. We like to clump it all together because that's easy, but only 15 to 20% of people, even with the best, most generous estimates from our smartest geneticists have a single piece of DNA that's responsible for their Parkinson. And so 80% or so we either don't know or getting back to what Dr. Dorsey discussed, there's an environment or an environment gene interaction. And so in summary, Parkinson is a neurological disorder. It's not just dopamine, but dopamine is one of those chemicals. You have a lot of symptoms, tremor, stiffness, slowness, but also a lot of these other symptoms and a lot of different treatments. And it's very common as Dr. Dorsey writes, now it is the, um, the most rapidly expanding neurological disorder. I understand that the number of people living with the disease has more than doubled to 6 million. Have research and medical advances made living with Parkinson's any easier? So, you know, the answer to that question is unequivocally yes. Um, we are actually doing a much better job. And, you know, the way I look at this is philosophically, the American and the Western healthcare systems, we focus so much on can we cure everything, right? And everything must have a cure and we must have an answer and there must be a switch. And we find that switch, Chris, and we hit that switch and everything turns around. Whereas the Eastern cultures are much more into healing, much more into the understanding of life as a process. You know, we all live and we all die and there's a, there's a, a certain rhythm to, to, uh, to life. 
And, and so when we think about this, the Western world has, you know, really had to start to do a better job in degenerative diseases like Parkinson and taking care of the people that are suffering when you have millions of people that are suffering from the disease. And so we actually now have, you know, some of the best, you know, palettes of treatments to choose from. And these range from behavioral treatments, things like exercise that are known to, to benefit Parkinson, medications, multiple dozens of different medications and ways you can take them, surgeries, and even like crazy things like sticking electricity in the brain have been very effective for Parkinson. And so the, um, the, the landscape, Chris, has really shifted from, uh, from what we saw in the 1960s, but in a lot of ways, it hasn't shifted fast enough because the single best drug remains dopamine replacement since the 1960s. And so we really need to double down and uh, increase our efforts in this area. Now you've mentioned dopamine a few times. Is there anything else that's a promising treatment on the horizon or is that really where most of the cards are being held? So one of the things that we talk about is this, you know, incredible underspending in Parkinson disease. And so if we spend at the rate that we are now at two or $300 million a year at the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest funder of research in the world, you're gonna end up with what you end up with. But to see the big changes in HIV and other diseases, we need to get up to like two or $3 billion. So first of all, we're not putting enough into the funnel to get enough out. So, so you know, when we think about this, there's so much more that we can do, particularly with the growth of the disease. Having said that, Chris, what's really exciting is, is that as we understand through science, the way these circuits connect, we now understand that Parkinson is not just a disease of dopamine, it's a disease of multiple systems and multiple circuits that are degenerating. And because of that, it gives us multiple um, opportunities to intervene across the circuit. So we no longer have to just give dopamine. So there are a whole bunch of different um, chemical receptors. There are a whole bunch of different electricity things. Your brain oscillates in different ways. I know it's hard for you to imagine, but right now your brain's oscillating in one frequency and Ray's is oscillating at one frequency and mine's going a million miles a minute. We can harness that for treatments, but there are also you know, changes that we can look at with specific receptors like we've done with cancer and then using things like the immune system. And so there's a whole bunch of areas and targets that we can get. And so that's why you end up with over a dozen different medications and approaches. And, you know, it really does come down to the simplistic idea that as we understand the brain better and we under the, understand the disease better, we have a, a greater shot at creating the therapies that are gonna make a difference in the next gen. This one's for both of you. What are the big takeaways from the book and how will Parkinson's impact this country economically if we don't act soon? So I think the biggest takeaway that I want people that come away with is that Parkinson's disease is to a large extent preventable. Um, Michael uh, actually depicted that in the United States, we love to go from a disease to a treatment or disease to a cure. Someone's got depression, we're gonna put them on an antidepressant. Uh, I think the key question when someone says that they're depressed is why are you depressed? And then if you figure out why they're depressed, maybe you can get rid of the depression altogether without even needing a pill or surgery or a cure. And the same thing with Parkinson's disease. It's now the world's fastest growing brain disease. 200 people will be diagnosed today with the disease. We need to figure out why people have the disease. Because no one, no one wants to spend the last 15 to 20 years of their life with a debilitating disease. And no one really wants to spend the last 15 to 20 years of their life caring for someone with a debilitating disease. I think to a large extent, Parkinson's disease is preventable. We change the way we use pesticides. We change the way we use certain industrial chemicals and get rid of them. And if we clean up our air, we can imagine a world where there are very, 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 very few people with Parkinson's disease. Chris, I'll just add, uh, you asked uh, kind of how I got into this and I would say I got into it because I wanted to be a history teacher. And, you know, if we want to, learn what to do here in Parkinson, we need to pay attention to the warning signs as Ray has pointed out and, and published extensively, you know, one of the most published authors on the 
these topics about how it's growing and how it's going to overcome, how it's going to swallow up our healthcare systems. We're not going to be able to afford this, you know, with Medicare will collapse. And so will other healthcare systems if we don't get this under control. But, you know, we have to use history and I love history and, and history um, was important when we wrote the book ending Parkinson's disease, because we looked at polio and we looked at HIV and we looked at cancers and we said, how did people do it? You know, how, how was it done? Right. And that, that's a good way. It's a good barometer, a good place to start. And so that was Genesis for us. And as we wrote the book, we really conceptually began to understand that there was a path and we called the path, the pact P A C T these people that had done it in polio and had done it in HIV, they had very strong prevention programs, uh, amazing advocacy, even up to the White House in some cases with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, in polio story, um, care. They didn't forget about the people who were suffering along the way and then development of treatments and making that funnel bigger. And certainly our funnel is not, not nearly big enough. So did you ever imagine that your, your interest of wanting to be a history teacher would lead you down the path of you know, the history of, of neurology? Um, so it turns out that, um, yes, uh, when I first came to the University of Florida, uh, funny story, I actually got an appointment in the history department. It was one of my one of my demands to my chair to take the job here when we moved from memory, my wife and I. And this was over 20 years ago. And at the beginning, I actually taught a course called History of Medicine to the what was called the junior honors students here at UF. But over time, I haven't um, had the, uh, the bandwidth, let's say, to continue doing that. So we still do a number of publications and sponsor students for rotations in history. Um, and now I'm mostly a philanthropist, you know, giving money to the college to support history and humanities. But I think it's important. And I think understanding where we came from in this Parkinson story is going to be, you know, the fundamental of where we're going. It's going to, it's going to shape that, that story. There's going to be a story here. And we just, it's not only us deciding how we want it to be told, but at what speed. And that's why what Ray is talking about is so important. It's like, sure, we can futz around, but the speed we're going right now, um, this isn't the story I think we're going to want to tell and to the next generation. And if I can, Kristen Michaels, a history lesson, you know, Parkinson's is a really recently described condition. Most of the description started in 1817 when Dr. Parkinson, a 61-year-old physician, was walking the streets of London and saw people walking around with a new disorder. He said, it's a new disorder. And they, they had a stoop posture, a shaking hand, and a shuffling gait. And he described six people with the condition, saying that this disease had not been classified in the medical literature. In the span of 200 years, we went from something that was very rare to something that's very common. The only way you do that is not through genetics and it's not even through aging. It's insufficient to account for the rise. It's through changes in our environment. And if we can change our environment over 200 years so that you can go from something very rare to very common, we can certainly change our environment the other way so we can go from very common to very rare, you know, prevent people from ever developing this disease in the first place. And sticking with the idea or the concept, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of telling the story, is ending Parkinson's disease a scholarly book? In other words, is it written for researchers by researchers? Or can the average person like myself who barely passed high school biology understand and get something from it? And you, you know, Chris, true. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because this gives me a great opportunity to give my good friend Ray Dorsey a hard time. But when, uh, when Ray invited me onto the project, I would say it started out pretty scholarly, you know, like, you know, very dense. And, um, and I'm kind of a simpleton. And, uh, and, and, um, and so, it, you know, we, uh, we worked a lot, actually, together, we had a lot of fun. But the idea was, in the end, we decided as a group and Todd Chair and Boston Bloom were with us. And I, I joke with Ray, but we decided as a group, we, we were tired of writing books that nobody was, were going to read, you know, like, and research articles that nobody reads. And, you know, I had learned, I had this experience in my own life where, and I've written hundreds of research articles, Chris, but this one book called 10 Secrets to a Happier Life with Parkinson's Disease became a runaway bestseller. More people have read that book about these 10 things you can do to improve your life. Nothing like earth shattering, just things I had observed as uh, taking care of these folks. And it, it taught me a great lesson. And so, um, so we really struggled um, and, and put up a good fight to, to, to not make it one of those books that's 
unreachable. We wanted it to be an interesting read. And, um, and even working as hard as we did, we also had editors uh, in the end that helped us that said we had to go even further because we thought we had gone all the way. And so, so it is a book for everyone. Can I, can I read you a 30 second excerpt, Chris? Please, absolutely. Uh, so this is from chapter five about this industrial chemical that's causing people to get Parkinson's disease. In 1988, Danny Fromm was a typical Southern California teenager who enjoyed working on cars, especially his red 1972 Chevy Nova with a black top. He paid $1,300 for it, money he had saved from working as a gas station attendant at the local, local Unocal 76. Fromm and his buddies replaced the car's engine, which made it really awesome and really fast, he recalled. The car gave the 17-year-old the freedom that he craved, freedom to do what he wanted when he wanted freedom that he no longer has. Straight out of high school, Fromm began working in the aerospace industry, cleaning circuit, or circuit boards with the solvent trichloroethylene, or TCE. Never warned of any risk or provided with protective gear, he inhaled the sweet smelling chemical and exposed his skin to it for eight hours a day over the course of a decade. And it goes on to talk about how he developed Parkinson's disease at 35, benefited from the surgical treatments that um, Michael Oaken and his colleagues at the University of Florida have pioneered. And he concludes his experience with a um, little thing. It says, if, if you're working with it, TCE from says, quit your damn job and get away from it. And um, so we write this in plain language. It says at a 10th grade uh, reading level. So if you finish high school, you're more than capable of uh, reading the book. And we write it with stories because... Uh, Michael rightly points out that the first drafts that I drafted were far too technical and written for graduate students, and we got it down to a high school level. And it's, it's mainly stories that I think are going to be relatable to most people listening. And if for any reasons people can't afford the book, they can just email us at info at endingpd.org. We'll send them a free, co free copy. And Michael and I and uh, Boss and Todd are donating all of our proceeds to efforts to end Parkinson's disease. That's terrific. And we'll, we'll give a plug on that again later in the show and also get it on social media. You talk about telling stories and, and making people aware of the disease and how people have, have gone through it, how they've suffered, how they've recovered. Have you found having any specific spokespersons able to do anything for you in terms of getting more awareness out there, you know, making it more commonplace, people talking about it more, getting more funding for research? So, um, so the answer is yes. Um, again, turning to history, you know, it, it turns out that whatever cause you have, um, having people who are known within the public eye makes a difference, you know, to advocacy efforts. It's just a, it's a historical fact. And, um, and so uh, when you looked at polio, so we took a, a, a deep dive to that. Uh, when you look at polio, it, uh, it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Eddie Cantor, who had a, who had a great radio show, Chris, like yours. And, um, and, and so, you know, those guys and others and Bob Hope and Parkinson disease, they drove an awareness. Muhammad Ali drove an awareness. Um, some of the folks that, um, that Ray and I have taken care of, some of the celebrities along the road, Janet Reno, the first female attorney general, showing courage to, to serve in their roles, even with Parkinson, to see an astronaut shot into space with Parkinson. So it makes a difference. Um, it makes a difference. And then, of course, the, the greatest story is, is the Michael J. Fox story where you know, he has really gone out there and made a huge difference by becoming public and becoming an advocate in Congress and, and a voice. But one of the things we learned in the book, Chris, was that we are not summing our voices enough. And, you know, and what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there's a lot of voices, but, it, you know, it gets back to this, this idea of synchronization and oscillation. Unless we synchronize our voices, they're not as powerful. And I think in other diseases, like particularly in HIV, when they synced, you know, when the sync came together, I mean, it was powerful, right? And that moment, I think all of us as authors have conceded that, you know, we've spent our lives advocating for Parkinson, getting people on the stage, everything. But the moment, that aha moment where it's synced up, we, we're not there yet and we need to stop self-congratulating ourselves, you know, about our, you know, and say, okay, that's, that's good what we did yesterday, but we need to shift into a different gear when it comes to advocacy. 
we need to take it to the next level. And one of the grassroots groups that's really cool that came out of this effort of the book was a group led by Larry Gifford, who um, I think he was born in Ohio, but he lives in British Columbia. He's a radio host too. And he, he started a group called the PD Avengers, you know, and, and, uh, and they've grown to thousands of people. This is like the grassroots of people with the disease and families that are affected. They have the voice. Like it's not going to be the four talking heads that wrote this book. You know, it's going to be these people rising up and synchronizing. And when they reach that sync, there'll be an aha moment. The funnel is going to open. We're going to get 10 times more funding into this and we're going to start to really see um, see the needle move. You know, a minute ago you talked about HIV and, you know, and them sinking and really advancing that cause. And I remember being in college when Magic Johnson came out saying he had HIV. And so he was, you know, their champion at the time, the, the, the medicine that was available obviously was very early and it took somebody with his means, you know, to, to be able to afford it. But fast forward 25 years later, that's something you don't talk about as much anymore. And so, you know, to your point, Dr. Oaken, and we'll talk about in the second half of the show, obviously having those champions out there, getting that funding, getting the sinking from the, the medical community, from the professional community, from the patient community is really what's going to take to, to really advance this forward. And so, uh, you know, looking forward to, to that next chapter for you. And, and Dr. Dorsey, a moment ago, you, you mentioned a few times actually about pesticides as well as industrial chemicals. Because pesticides are one of these obviously apparent culprits, does that put our agricultural workers at greater risk? Yeah, so uh, farmers are at 150% increased risk of developing uh, Parkinson's disease. And it's not just farmers, but people who live in rural areas often get their water from private wells, which is subject to contamination from pesticide runoff from nearby farms. People can be drinking pesticide contaminated water for years, never know it, and then develop Parkinson's disease decades uh, later. Gentlemen, this question is for both of you. How is advanced technology revolutionizing the way that the medical profession is able to deliver healthcare in general, and the way you interact with patients specifically? So if you think about it, the way we provide care is kind of backwards. We generally ask sick patients to come see generally healthy clinicians on our terms. We should be providing care to sick patients on their terms. We should be bringing care to patients instead of patients to care. And one of the silver linings of the COVID-19 pandemic has been widespread adoption of telemedicine, which allows uh, physicians to see patients in their home environment without them having to travel anywhere and so that people can benefit from the expertise of, of Dr. Michael Oaken and his colleagues, uh, whether they live in Gainesville, Florida, or they live in Orlando or in Tallahassee or anywhere else in Florida or beyond. And um, this is a very powerful way of providing uh, care to patients. The reimbursement that's been allowed by Medicare to allow widespread adoption of telemedicine is temporary. We need to make those changes permanent. Uh, so contact your representative or senators, make sure that telemedicine uh, chain, telemedicine remains covered by Medicare so we can fulfill Medicare's original vision, which was to guarantee access to healthcare for older Americans at a time in 1965 when half did not have that access. So to that point about writing your elected officials, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, they need to approve this to expand it, to make it permanent for Medicare? Yeah, it require, it'll require congressional uh, action uh, to do so. Otherwise, it'll disappear. And before the COVID-19 pandemic, no one really talked about uh, telemedicine. Uh, less than one out of every thousand Medicare beneficiaries benefited from telemedicine. And now in the span of, uh, in March 2020, adoption of telemedicine increased a hundredfold among Medicare beneficiaries. I think uh, over 50 million Medicare beneficiary visits have happened uh, over the last year from telemedicine. People want to receive care. They want to receive it on their terms. They want to receive it regardless of where they live or their proximity at the medical centers. And, you know, if you have Parkinson's disease, you have impaired driving ability, you have overburdened caregivers. Um, you know, you tend to live in rural and suburban areas where people like Michael Oaken and I are generally not located. And you want to be able to access the care you need. And the more severe your condition, the greater your care needs are and often the least uh, able you are to access that care. We're already seeing, Chris, um, I had a meeting this morning uh, here locally. It's not just here, but in other centers, the Parkinson Foundation has centers of excellence all across the country, over 40. We're already seeing individual insurance carriers starting to back off on coverage of telemedicine for health conditions like Parkinson's disease. And although 
it remains um, in effect for most carriers. We're starting to see them limit and limit and bring it down again. And what Dr. Dorsey says is, is um, it's, it's, it's important. And I think your listeners should pay attention to this because it's our voices that make a difference. And, you know, I know for over a decade working with the, the really hardworking folks at Parkinson Foundation, Ted Thompson at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, we worked so hard to try to get um, telemedicine for Parkinson's disease, and we weren't able to do it. And part of the reason was, is that the, the way that we do things in America and healthcare, I hate to break it to everybody, but sometimes it's just wrong and we were doing it wrong. And so in Canada, when you do telemedicine, you define the visit as to where the doctor or where the healthcare provider, sometimes it's not a doctor, is located. In the U.S., we don't. We define it by where the individual patient or person with the disease is. And this is not a small issue. So this means that if I saw somebody before the pandemic in Georgia, let's take Georgia, okay? Not too far, I'm in Northern Florida, I'm in a small college town where the Gators are. If I drive a little bit north, I can get over that border. If I see a patient by telemedicine in Georgia before the pandemic, they can charge me and bring me to court for practicing medicine without a license, okay? And, um, and so we just, we've just been doing it wrong and we haven't been able to get the legislation. Ray and I wrote a piece with Boston Bloom and JAMA Neurology, the Journal of the American Medical Association's journal, uh, about this at the beginning of the pandemic that we achieved in the first 12 days of the pandemic, what, you know, more than we did in the previous 12 years in getting telemedicine out there, bringing care to the home. But people don't understand we're going to lose it if we if we sit on our on our heels. We're going to get knocked on our butts on this one, and so um, so it, it's super important we pay attention. And through COVID and, and using telemedicine and telehealth, are doctors able to see more patients now per day? Just given the timing, I think there are marginal gains to be had in terms of efficiency. The real winners in this uh, aren't doctors. The real winners are patients because uh, they can receive the care that they need and the convenience of their home and the comfort of their home without having to travel. And by the way, traveling to Gainesville or traveling to Rochester is not inexpensive. You know, you can be traveling 50 to 100 miles to come see us. You have to pay for parking. You have to take time out from work or your spouse has to take up time from work or your child does. It's really uh, expensive. The real winners here are patients. We're in the infancy of telemedicine. You can start thinking, uh, one of my patients participates in physical therapy with 100 other uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, all from a physical therapist at Harvard Medical School. So you can start thinking about one clinician caring for many patients at the same time, whether that's speech therapy or physical therapy or occupational therapy or psychologists or group counseling. There are tons and tons of ways uh, to expand uh, the way we uh, deliver care to patients, but we need to have a mechanism in place whereby people who've been paying for 50 years into Medicare are guaranteed access to the care that they need uh, and care that they've been frankly paid for, prepaid for, for the last five decades. So then if the number of patients being seen hasn't really increased that much, what's the drawback for the insurance companies? Why are they trying to, to rein it back in? Because they're, they're not covering more, any more doctor visits. So if you think about insurance in general, what's an insurance economic model? If you collect premiums, you earn returns on those premiums and you try not to pay out anything on the back end. So if you can make all care inaccessible, you win. Um, and that's not the purpose of Medicare. Again, lots of, lots of presidents, a Republican and Democrat, uh, lots of uh, legislators spent years, decades, failures uh, to come up with Medicare, which is uh, and widely viewed as probably one of the great public policy successes in the United States uh, history and immensely popular because it works. And because people who are over 65 don't worry about losing their health insurance because they lose their job. They know it's there regardless of what happens to them and to their employment. They don't worry about losing their health insurance if they get sick and uh, that Medicare is going to drop them. And we just need to make sure that Medicare continues to enable to patients to receive care on their terms instead of the terms of doctors and hospitals. Well, I'll say it again later in the show, but I'm going to say it now to all of our listeners out there. Call and write your congressman, your congresswoman, your senator. Beat the drum, pound the pavement. Let's get it done because this is extremely, extremely important stuff. And to your point, Dr. Dorsey, you know, Medicare is one of those great success stories. And let's, you know, like you said, we prepaid for it. And so let's uh, keep that success story going. And sticking with technology, 
Are there any pieces of technology in particular that you strongly feel will make profound impacts on the health of Americans in the coming decades? Yeah, so um, I'll start. Um, I, I believe that we are on an inevitable path that the way that we take care of people is already changing and it will be changed for this generation and the next generation. Um, as Dr. Dorsey, you know, talks about moving medicine into the home is one of the things that's going to happen and so important for people with degenerative diseases in particular, right? You know, allowing people to stay within their own homes. And one of the things he didn't say that I, I, I love it when he does is that people disappear from our clinics with these diseases. So if your mother had Alzheimer's or Parkinson disease, at some point they can't get to the clinic you know, so they can't even get care, you know, because the disease itself robs them of that ability to, to travel. It becomes too difficult, too expensive. There are too many barriers. And so moving into the home is one. The second uh, is a revolution in the ability to monitor diseases from a distance. You're seeing it in heart disease already. We are monitoring the brain implants that um, Dr. Dorsey mentioned in our own studies. I have National Institutes of Health studies, and you know we're monitoring people in their home settings now, their brain waves, their oscillations, and uh, and able to um, to adjust their therapies based on what we see at a distance. And of course, some of that will be plugged into you know, automated AI, you know, this automated intelligence or, or as Gary Kasparov calls augmented intelligence, right? It's still going to take a human to interpret it. But, um, but that data stream coming in is going to be very valuable. And when you take a disease, let's say like Parkinson disease, Chris, you know, the, the people, they wear off with their medications, they get extra movements called dyskinesia, they get walking and falling. So if, if you can tell everything about them, their sleep and, and have a report and you see what's going on in their real life within their home setting, you can probably do a better job at adjusting their medications. We've even seen this in monitoring people with another neurological disease called epilepsy, where we see their, we see their brain waves, these people that have epilepsy, and we change their medicines based on the, you know, the remote amount we see oh my gosh, every morning at 8.30, Chris's brain starts to, you know, put out this signal that's like a, a you know, a pre-signal that 30% of the time ends in a seizure. Maybe we should give Chris a little more med at eight o'clock. So by the time 8.30 hits, that won't happen. So we don't have that advantage now. So I think you're going to see personalization and individualization to uh, people at a scale like we've never seen before. And I, I'm fascinated to hear what Ray thinks, but um, but that's the direction I think things are headed. What do you think, Ray? Uh, I'm not gonna disagree uh, with Michael. I think one nice thing about technology is that um, things change rapidly and they change at an accelerating pace. Uh, so, you know, we have these smartphones around us, uh, which we view as like indispensable. These things are all of 12, 14 years old. So they're just a teenager and they're just an adolescent and their means for measuring health. So we know these can measure key features of Parkinson's disease. I don't think we're far away from these devices being used to diagnose people with Parkinson's disease, both in the United States and other parts of the world. And I don't think we're too far away from these uh, devices being able to connect people to care regardless of where they are or who they are. Um, in large portions of the world, the majority of people with Parkinson's disease, a highly treatable condition are never diagnosed. And that should be unacceptable. We have the means uh, to reach uh, people, we should now just summon the will uh, to make sure that that happens. And Dr. Dorsey, you've told your colleagues in the medical profession that the status quo is not working. It does seem that for a long time, medicine has been reactive with regards to Parkinson's. Obviously, you both are very proactive in your approach to working with those who have the disease. What can we do to prevent individuals from developing the disease in the first place? Yeah, so the status quo is not working. So anytime you say that your disease is the world's fastest growing uh, condition, that's a problem. Anytime you say that the most effective medication for it's 50 years old, that's a problem. Anytime you say we've had more therapeutic advances last century than this century, uh, that's a problem. Uh, and so we can't expect things to change unless we change ourselves, uh, both the people and the processes that are in place. We are ignoring what are the root causes of Parkinson's disease. 
we are ignoring the root causes of Parkinson's disease. And those root causes are certain pesticides. Pesticides are nerve toxins, right? That's how they work. Um, many of them dissolve in the brain. Many of them are found in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease after they die. We need to get rid of uh, these industrial chemicals, dry cleaning solvents. If you think about it, we have thousands of contaminated sites around the country and around the world because we want dry cleaning, not using water because we're afraid our garments will shrink. So we use these toxic chemicals which are poured into the ground, contaminate groundwater. So up to 30% of the groundwater is contaminated with these chemicals that people are drinking. And then like radon, which evaporates from the soil, these uh, underground water plumes evaporate these vapors of chemicals into people's homes, schools, and workplaces without people even knowing them, knowing it. And then they develop Parkinson's disease not the next day, they develop Parkinson's disease 40 years later. So it's like a perfect crime where they, the, the person who pulled the trigger has long since uh, disappeared. And we are getting more and more evidence about the harmful effects of pesticides, these industrial chemicals and air pollution. These are all tractable, uh, tractable uh, issues that we can address and that other countries have addressed. And we seem to do the same thing in the United States to prevent future generations from developing this uh, scourge that's uh, crossing the United States and the world. Scourge, yeah. perf perfect word. Sorry, Dr. I, yeah, I would just add to that. Um, well, one, you know, every time Ray, um, you know, talks about this, I, you know, if people on the line are a little bit like scared, I get a little scared too. <laughs> you know, like this is this is like daunting, you know, um, but it should scare us. And, you know, and I think that prevention is, you know, key. And I think Ray has been the world's best advocate in this area of making sure you get rid of the pesticides, the chemicals and those things. But I also wanna point out that if we increase the funnel of research that's going into the NIH from 200 or 300 million to two or 3 billion, we're gonna get more output. And there's a couple of things that could be game changers for us in terms of our ability to, um, to advance faster. One is a biomarker of how the disease progresses. So something besides just a test at the bedside, but like an image or a blood test or something where we could give a therapy, Chris, and we could say with certainty in a small number of people, not thousands of people like you need for a big cancer study, in a small number of people, we could say, oh yeah, the disease went back, you know, like, or the disease stopped progressing. And I think people don't realize we don't have that yet, okay? And so there's a number of groups working on that, but we need to catalyze our efforts to develop those specific types of biomarkers because you go from needing thousands of people to hundreds of people and you can test more therapies, you can get more through the funnel. The second thing is, is we need more ideas and we need to, to um, look beyond, you know, that there's going to be one answer. You, you know, when we saw AZT, for example, for HIV, it became combination therapy. And you mentioned HIV with Magic Johnson. And in those days, it was a death sentence. When I was an intern in medicine, we had wards of people that had HIV. And if you got HIV, it was a death sentence. Now it's a chronic, you know, disease. And Magic Johnson's, you know, still here, still doing well. Great businessman, was just the coach of the Lakers. I mean, it's an incredible story. And if we want to get there, we've got to look beyond, you know, our, our, you know, our tunnel vision. It's only going to be one therapy. We've got to bring more people in and, um, and we've got to be able to track the disease and measure it. So our number needed to treat goes down. And, and then finally, back to the technology piece, Ray taught me this, which is, I, I think, really important. And that's that what if you can run the clinical trials at home? So a lot of times, Chris, you want to get into a clinical trial you know, for a new medication, but it just ain't going to happen because you don't have the money to travel back and forth to Gainesville, Florida, or to Rochester, New York. What if I said to you, Chris, we can ship you the drug. We can monitor you, you remotely. We can do this all from a distance or most of it at a distance. It's a game changer. And so, you know, Dr. Dorsey's always talked about that as another game changer. And we shouldn't forget about that as being an important path for us to consider. Well, and Dr. Dorsey just mentioned about the smartphones and, and tracking health and, and Dr. Oaken talking about, you know, self-administering at home. Are there apps being developed for this? You know, are there other technological advancements being put forth or being developed that, you know, can make, help hopefully accelerate this? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, and so there are smartphone applications that, you know, provide guidance to, to individuals with Parkinson's. There are smartphone applications 
primarily in a research setting that can help measure your disease. And so people can actually kind of like, they just test, if they have diabetes, they can test their blood glucose at home and determine how much insulin to take. You know, can you just measure your Parkinson's disease symptoms at home and determine how much levodopa uh, to take? I mean, I think those things are coming. Um, Dr. Ogden was, works on surgical treatments uh, for Parkinson's disease. So you can imagine if you have wires into your brain, can that, those wires, can the stimulation of those wires be dictated by how fast you're moving or how much you're able to ambulate or uh, your activity level. So I think those things are coming. Uh, it's gonna require investment. Um, Dr. Oaken talks about this 200 million, $250 million NIH invests. The economic burden of Parkinson's in the United States alone is $50 billion, $50 billion, $25,000 per person just to Medicare and $25,000 per person to families in terms of lost labor wages or uh, the cost of caring for people in their home. So if you have something that has an economic burden of $50 billion per year, you probably want to spend more than $200 million, less than 1% uh, to change the course of this disease. Uh, Michael has indicated we need an operation warp speed for diseases like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, you know, which together affect one out of every 50 Americans. One out of every 50 Americans has either uh, Parkinson's or uh, Alzheimer's disease. If we change uh, the course of these diseases, we can let people live longer lives and let people live a healthier uh, lives. And Dr. Oaken, you've mentioned a few times now, two to 300 million going to two to 3 billion. You know, we know that funding plays a huge role in virtually every public policy and medical initiative. You know, without it, things don't get done. That's a huge, huge increase in funding. Where does it come from? Yeah, so good question. And, you know, the answer is, you know, as always, it, it's part of the National Institutes of Health budget. It's part of how we prioritize research, right? So we put a lot of money into research and we have to ask ourselves, are we putting it into the right places, right? So if you have the fastest growing neurological disease and you're going to let it overtake you, you know, would you budget in that? And, and I'm not, you know, obviously I don't want to get online on the chair of neurology and the executive director of an institute. So I, I could really get a lot of fruit thrown at me here by saying, you know, let's retool where we're putting our money. But certainly, you know, it starts there with anybody who's done a budget. But, um, but also our commitment needs to be greater. And if you look at it as percentage of GDP or any of the economic health indicators that Dr. Dorsey has mentioned, it's absolutely foolish not to put the investment into something that could bankrupt Medicare or take down, you know, all of these medical systems. And people talk about, oh, we're going to get taken down by COVID-19 or, oh, we're going to get taken down by, you know, another virus in the future. Or, oh, there, there's going to be a war. You know, you know, I would say, you know, we're going to get taken down by neurodegenerative diseases, you know, over the long span, you know, you know, more than any of these things, you know, combined. And, um, and we've got to wake up to that reality. And so there has to be reallocation, but there has to be appropriate allocation to, um, to, to what, you know, what is important and what is important to society. So, do, you know, what do we value? And so that's not just in, in healthcare, but that's in other things, how we, how we spend our money. And so it's, it's important also for us to have partners. And we always talk about, you know, if you look at, wars and efforts that had been more or less successful, you know, having a coalition of partners is really important. And in science, that's super important. And so, you know, the NIH is the, the largest funder of healthcare research in the world, but we shouldn't go it alone, right? We shouldn't be like, well, we're egotistical. We, we always going to go it alone. We should be more welcoming to say, hey, everybody, here's this Parkinson problem. Maybe we we could all put a few billion dollars into this together and we could speed this up. We need partners from other countries, other health systems. And there's no, according to Ray Dorsey's research, and I believe Ray, and uh, you know, he's a good guy and very credible researcher. According to his research, it's on every planet, it's on every, it's in every domain, it's in every zip code. Okay, so we all have that in common. Can't we all come together, fund it? Same with uh, industry sources, we could bring industry and so. So, you know, we, we oscillate, we synchronize our voices for advocacy, but we also have to synchronize our voices for research. And so getting NIH up to a few billion, you know, is one thing from the U.S., but you also want to get other health systems to, to, to pay into this because everybody could benefit the planet. Can I just amplify, Chris? 
we're paying, you're going to pay for it on the front end or the back end. So it's just a decision of where you want to pay for it. Right now we're paying for it on the back end. So we, Medicare pays all of us $25 billion per year for people with Parkinson's disease. And we're spending $250 million on the front end. So we're spending 1% on the front end and $1 on the front end and $100 on the back end. My suspicion is we spend $10 on the front end. We won't be paying $100 on the back end. We'll be paying half or a quarter of that much. And we have great examples. So the March of Dimes, which Michael alluded to in the 1930s, raised millions of dollars through really millions of dimes being mailed to the White House. And uh, 15 years later, we had a polio, uh, a vaccine for polio, which eradicated polio from the United States and from most of the world. And now we have no polio centers. We have no polio treatments because we don't need them because we've gotten rid of the disease. Uh, 1980s HIV in the span of... uh, 15 years, 16 years, we went from something that was uniformly and rapidly fatal to something that's associated with a near normal life expectancy. And that came with a huge investment from the federal government uh, into uh, HIV, two to $3 billion per year. And that has saved thousands, millions of us from ever getting HIV in the first place. We should be paying attention to who doesn't have these diseases because of the investments that we made in both in uh, treating the disease and in preventing the disease. The final example is uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. They have fundamentally made drunk driving socially unacceptable. They didn't say that we need better treatment centers and better uh, uh, trauma centers and better ambulances and better emergency medical technicians. They say we need to stop drinking and driving. We need to get to the root cause of this and prevent people from suffering unspeakable harms and horrors to families and have saved thousands, millions of people's lives and families and taxpayers millions, if not billions of dollars by investing in preventing these diseases, these conditions from ever happening in the first place. We should take lessons from history, apply them to Parkinson's disease, and imagine a world where Parkinson's disease is not the world's fastest growing brain disease, but one that's fit for the history books. Write your congressman, congresswoman, write your senator. We're out of time. Dr. Ray Dorsey, Dr. Michael Oaken, thanks so much for your time today. Thank Thank you. I'm Chris Meek. This is Next Steps Forward. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Until then, keep taking your next steps forward.